with 0.3% of the world's population, has direct control over 11% of the world's uh, safe carbon budget emissions in 2030. Now what this shows is that the actions Australia takes regarding fossil fuels, particularly exports, have a massive effect on the world's ability to avoid runaway climate change. Now you might be asking yourself, how can all of this happen under Australia's new policy settings? Don't we have a clean energy future package that's going to stop all of this? Well, uh, the short answer is no. Well, we do have a clean energy future package, but it won't stop all of this. All of the charts and figures that I've just shown you are based on government data that already factors in the impact of the Clean Energy Future Package and its centrepiece of carbon pricing scheme. On export emissions, the explanation is simple. The carbon pricing scheme does not apply to the emissions embodied in the fossil fuels we export, so it won't touch those. Um, it's, a domestic, uh, it's a domestic scheme only, um, consistent with how we've traditionally seen our responsibility <coughs> as being one of purely reducing domestic emissions, consistent with the UN accounting rules. So, on the one hand, you've got the Australian government spin machine telling everyone we're going to have a clean energy future because we have a domestic carbon price. Now, on the other hand, you've got the Federal Labor government and the Liberal National governments in the resource-rich states with aggressive fossil fuel expansion policies for export. Now, on domestic emissions only, um, the story is a little bit more complex because obviously the carbon pricing scheme will have some impact. So this is, these um, next three graphs are from the Treasury modelling of the impact of a carbon price. Now, this line shows Australia's projected emission, emissions under business as usual, without a carbon price. So we're going to avoid that on domestic emissions at least. Um, but now, the dark brown line here shows Australia's domestic emissions with a carbon price. And you can see that our domestic emissions will go up slightly until about 2025. And then they'll fall slightly down to 2050, where they'll end up almost exactly as they were in 2010. Now this black line shows Australia's emissions reduction targets. The, um, the difference, the reason we, we're not there despite having these targets, the reason we'll be projected to be there, um, is because of the heavy, expected heavy reliance on international offsets. So basically, companies that are liable under the Australian scheme are allowed to rely on certain um, prescribed types of international credits, uh, emissions reductions that occur overseas that Australian companies pay for, and then use those to comply with their domestic obligations. And that explains the difference between um, the targets and the likely, uh, the likely reductions in Australia. Now, to put that in context, we've overlaid this blue line, which is not from Treasury. Um, this, is what, this is one representation of what Australia's trajectory should be on the basis of Australia's fair share of the two degree budget. This is from the German Advisory Council on Climate Change, which <coughs> looked at different countries, different categories of countries' fair shares, taking into account their population size and their level of economic development. <coughs> so you can see how our current carbon pricing scheme sends completely the wrong price signal to the Australian economy. It should be sending a price signal along the lines of the blue line about the urgent need to repower the Australian economy with renewable energy. And instead, we get the brown line, uh, and this is what the Federal Energy Minister and Federal Climate Change Minister have said about the price signals that we can expect from the carbon pricing scheme. So the Energy Minister says that a price on carbon is going to create a huge growth opportunity for gas. And the Minister for Climate Change says that for baseload electricity generation, it will be gas-fired electricity that we see emerge. And for that investment to be committed, we need a carbon price in the economy. Now, in the report, we explain in a little bit more detail why we cannot allow gas to be the transition fuel for Australia or anywhere really. Um, uh, but very briefly, to summarise, the key reasons are that um, there is, a, there is a, a considerable risk that the life cycle emissions from gas plants, when you include um, the sources of those emissions, particularly where they're likely to come from coal seam gas, there's a risk that the life cycle emissions could actually be higher uh, than the life cycle emissions of coal-fired power uh, due to emissions, uh, methane emissions that escape in the extraction process. 
Um, but even if they do end up lower on the life cycle basis than coal, uh, by building new gas plants, we still lock in fossil fuel emissions that are significant um, for you know, new gas plants have lifespans of 30 and 50 years. So either way, um, it's not the strategy we should, we should be employing. So what's the government's long-term solution for reducing all of these uh, emissions from coal and gas in Australia and overseas? Well, it's carbon capture and storage. Now, this is an artist's impression of a coal plant with CCS. Uh, you can see it's conveniently located right on the foreshore there, and it comes fully equipped with deck chairs and beach balls. Now, again, in the report, we explain why CCS cannot be the solution. In summary, we don't know if CCS will be technically viable at scale. We don't know if it will be cheaper than renewable energy at the time it is commercialised, if ever. And we don't know the full extent of the risks of carbon dioxide leaking from storage sites. And it will take a minimum of 10, and probably more like 20 years to find out any of those things. Uh, and if we keep burning fossil fuels globally at the current rate, for the next 10 or 15 years, we'll have exhausted the world's two degree carbon budget by then. Now, the Australian government is a massive supporter of CCS technology. It would not be unfair to characterise its current climate strategy as being to keep on using and exporting fossil fuels for as long as we can, and basically just hope that CCS becomes technically viable at scale, commercially sensible, and socially accepted just in time to capture and store all of Australia's domestic and exported fossil fuel emissions. And again, uh, you couldn't put it better than the Minister for Energy. He says, the challenge on climate change is to reduce emissions, gas and clean energy, and carbon capture and storage is a potential solution to coal-fired power internationally. And so it's clear, actually, that Australia is already a leader. We are leading the world rapidly in the wrong direction. We are digging ourselves deeper into fossil fuel infrastructure, making fossil fuels cheaper by supplying more and more of them to the world, and making climate agreements harder to solve by worsening the problem that they're trying uh, to negotiate their way out of. The emissions within our sphere of control and influence are so large that our actions materially lower the chances of achieving a safe climate. But this also gives us power. It gives us the power to lead the world in the right direction. In the second half of the report, we, we outline a new paradigm for international climate cooperation uh, and what it should look like, and we set out a series of practical steps that Australia should take to lead the world to zero carbon prosperity. In the remainder of my talk, I'm going to briefly summarise those now. So we come first to this new paradigm. <coughs> now, we call it cooperative decarbonisation. And the idea is instead of trying to solve climate change through a grand bargain using treaties, targets and trade, uh, we, we, we adopt this new paradigm for cooperative decarbonisation. Now, we're not saying abandon the UN process. It will inevitably continue and it should continue. But at least in the critical decade, in the short to medium term, we need to focus our, e our efforts elsewhere. <coughs> so, what is cooperative decarbonisation? Well, first of all, it's a practical problem solving approach to decarbonising every emissions intensive economic and social process, from stationary energy to transport, industrial processes, land use, and much more. It's about using all of the levers at our disposal to influence the global emissions trajectory. Not merely domestic emissions, but also exported emissions and imported emissions and emissions in other countries that we can also influence. It's driven by national leadership. This recognises that leadership moving ahead of the pack is essential. It means doing what's necessary and what's right to decarbonise our own economy, irrespective of whether other countries are doing the right thing too. It means providing an example that other countries and activists and businesses and communities within those countries can follow. And it's about developing the products and services that other countries will need when they do decide to follow. This kind of leadership can have a huge impact on its own, as I'll talk about further in a minute, 
but it can also generate its own political momentum. It can break cooperative deadlocks like we're seeing within the United Nations. And fourthly, whilst driven by national leadership, it's amplified and accelerated by international cooperation. And the cooperative decarbonisation approach recognises that the challenges we face in terms of decarbonising those discrete economic and social processes can actually be solved by a relatively small number of countries working together ahead of everyone else. So we should aim, for example, to enhance cooperation between countries with similar resources, similar challenges, similar skills and opportunities in particular parts of the problem, particularly those other countries who are also willing to move ahead of the pack, of which there are already others. For example, Italy, Spain, the US and the United Arab Emirates and Australia could be working much harder to accelerate the, the, uh, the arrival of concentrated solar thermal as at grid parity with fossil fuels. We don't need to wait for 193 countries to reach a grand bargain to be doing that. The other aspect of international cooperation, of course, recognises that there is an equity dimension here, that we will need to be assisting developing countries to make the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And so we recommend uh, a range of cooperative partnerships. Just for example, think about the potential for Australia cooperating with India on solar energy to deliver, um, deliver off-grid um, remote electricity to many of the world's energy poor that aren't connected to a grid. So in short, you could call cooperative decarbonisation uh, cutting carbon emissions by doing whatever we can, wherever we can, working with whoever we can, as fast as we can. And we argue that Australia is a uh, uniquely placed to lead uh, in this process. Now, the Zero Carbon Australia plans provide outstanding examples of the first three of those elements of property decarbonisation. They provide a path forward for completely decarbonising the key sectors, uh, which are listed there, plus the other ones that Matthew mentioned at the start. Um, and of course, many of you will be familiar with the stationary energy plan. With Lagarde to leader, what we're aiming to do is show how these domestic actions can be leveraged for maximum impact globally to steer other countries away uh, from uh, the, the unsustainable trajectory that we are on. Now, in Lagarde's leader, we focus primarily on the energy sector. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. The main reason for that is because it's the area where Australia can make the biggest difference. The second reason, and this explains why the renewable energy chapter is the biggest in our report, is that uh, Beyond Zero Emissions and the Melbourne Energy Institute have already done the domestic work on, uh, on the decarbonisation of the stationary energy sector. Um, and on fossil fuels, as I'll explain in a minute, we propose some initial steps internationally, um, but we recognise that there'll be much further work that needs to be done, that Beyond Zero Emissions is trying to do, um, and that others need to assist with as well, in order to spell out a precise plan for fossil fuel export income replacement um, and the precise impacts of uh, global uh, fossil fuel phase out. And you can start to see that, that, that all of these plans will start to uh, have complementarities that will enhance their overall impact. And our vision for Lagarde to leader is that we'll be able to release additional reports as new versions of the um, Zero Carbon Australia project release. So for example, in industrial processes, um, we'll, we'll be able to allow a detailed plan for Zero Carbon steel making, which will also affect our ability to phase out metallurgical coal exports, um, and particularly to developing countries that rely on them for, for making steel. And similarly, in the transport plan, we'll be able to show the savings in oil imports and oil import costs that we'll make, which can counterbalance um, reduced reliance on coal and gas exports. Okay, so let's turn to what Australia can do when it comes to providing global leadership on energy in the context of property decarbonisation. So one of the key ways of decarbonising the station energy sector is simply to make renewable energy cheaper than fossil fuels. When that happens in all major markets, new energy generation plants will be renewable by the <coughs> Now at some, part, at some point, these two paths will cross, but it will be too late for a safe climate. For essential zero carbon technologies, Australia has the power to make these two lines cross substantially quicker and possibly even on its own uh, within the critical decade. And this power uh, comes from two sources. And I should just say, of course, we recognise that there are different cost curves for different technologies, and similarly with fossil fuels, uh, some like oil are going up, um, and some like coal are 